I grew up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I was born in uh, 1934 and uh, lived in Wisconsin uh, most of my uh, uh, childhood and uh, part of my adult life. Uh, my mother and father came over from Poland at the turn of the century. And we did things together. Uh, we ate together, unlike a lot of things that go on today in some families. Uh, we were brought up uh, Catholic. Uh, in a very uh, religious family. Not overly religious, but religious enough. And uh, my father was uh, reasonably uh, strict, uh, keeping me uh, towing the line. And uh, so he's uh, really my, uh, my hero, as well as my mother, who uh, in those days kind of uh, mother brought up most of the families anyway, uh, as far as the children were concerned. So uh, they did a good job. Robert Mojayevsky attended the University of Wisconsin, where he was a member of the Marine Corps Platoon Leaders class. Upon graduation in 1957, he was commissioned a second lieutenant. By 1966, he was in Vietnam, serving as commanding officer in the 3rd Battalion of the 4th Marines. In June of that year, he was to take part in Operation Hastings, an action that aimed to stop the North Vietnamese from infiltrating into the South through the demilitarized zone and Laos. The operation started out as a helicopter assault. And then my company uh, had initially four helicopters in the initial attack. So when we got to the landing zone, we started to take some small arms fire. So because the helicopter landing zone was too uh, small to accommodate the four helicopters, two of them got too close together and crashed and uh, started to burn and, uh, and some of the Marines who were trying to get out of the helicopter were killed. So it wasn't a very auspicious beginning. But once uh, my unit landed and we started to take off for our objective, which was about, oh, I guess 1,500 meters away from where we landed and that was to be our blocking position. Shortly after landing, the company encountered a well-entrenched enemy force. Mojayevsky led his men in a successful routing of the enemy and the seizure of a large quantity of ammunition and supplies. That evening, after reaching their position and setting up a perimeter, the group repelled an enemy counterattack. This marked the beginning of a battle that would continue over the next four days and three nights. Uh, what happened is uh, they were getting stronger all the time while I was getting weaker from casualties, uh, lack of ammunition, the fact that we were surrounded for most of the, the time that we were there, and uh, the fact that I couldn't get reinforced with other uh, Marines because they were busy elsewhere. But we couldn't evacuate the dead or any of the seriously wounded because the jungle was so uh, massive that there was no helicopter landing area that you could land a helicopter for him to take out your dead or your wounded. And then on the third night, again, we were attacked by a battalion-sized force of enemy. So now it's about 500 to 1 against us because by this time I've got probably about 100 uh, Marines that are capable of fighting. And uh, this lasted a long time into the night. Massively outnumbered and surrounded, Mojayevsky skillfully directed artillery fire within close range of his position with devastating effect on the enemy. At one point, he managed to crawl 200 meters through heavy enemy fire to provide ammunition to an exposed element of his command. And then on the fourth day, my battalion commander called me up and told me that the battalion's going to move to another area. And he wanted me to be the rear guard of the battalion. 
I told the battalion commander, I said, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't have enough Marines here to protect the little sisters of the poor, let alone protect uh, the rear of the battalion. But uh, nevertheless, that was my mission, and we moved back about 1,500 yards. And then <clears throat> as soon as we got back to the landing zone where the two helicopters had crashed, um, out of the hills comes all these whistles and screaming and mortars going off and machine guns and, and everything else. And uh, all these uh, North Vietnamese, about a thousand of them, were coming out of the hills. The only way we were able to survive was we called in uh, airstrikes very close to our position that dropped napalm right in front of us. Uh, in fact, uh, we had some of the Marines uh, get singed because the napalm was so close. And we had artillery come in uh, almost on top of our positions. Uh, some of our Marines got hit with some artillery fragments. And uh, again, it came down to not quite hand-to-hand -hand combat, but very, very close. This went on for about four hours, and finally, for some unknown reason, the North Vietnamese uh, just kind of picked up and went back into the hills. So we were very fortunate, and uh, so after that, essentially, we uh, moved with the rest of the battalion and caught up with them and went to a new position. I learned about receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor when I was stationed at Annapolis at the uh, Naval Academy in Maryland. I was the commanding officer of the Marine Barracks, and uh, one day my, uh, command, my commanding officer, who was a Navy captain of the Naval Station, informed me that uh, I was going to get the, uh, the Medal of Honor. I never looked at it as, as something that belonged to me personally. It was always uh, for the wounded and those that died and the sacrifices that they made. And, it's hard to not go to the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. and experience that and not become very emotional. There's just something about it. Uh, it's, it's a very emotional place. We fight for the freedom of this country, for the freedom of the citizens of this country. It doesn't matter what war you're in. War is war is war. Uh, we owe sacrifices to the millions of of men and women who have uh, sacrificed their lives for this country. Nevertheless, I'm the guy wearing it, you know, for them.